foundation and my refuge and my And Holy Spirit, Trinity, Co-Essential and Undivided. Be mercy. A sacrifice of praise. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, our one true God. Amen. Greetings, everybody, and welcome. Welcome to our weekly sermon of the Genuine Orthodox Church of America, performed or executed by me, the most beloved Archbishop of those in the Church and the most hated Archbishop of those outside the Church. I think that's an accurate uh, description of who I am. Anyhow, <clears throat> Today is the 14th Sunday after Pentecost, and we have, um, we celebrate today the great martyr Ephemia. Let's put up an icon of the great martyr. Remember, she's the one who not only during her life, but after her death confessed the truth of orthodoxy. <clears throat> A look at that wonderful scroll that she's holding. And today we also celebrate the, great, uh, the martyr Ludmila, princess of the Czechs. Ah, uh, Ludmila. Okay, Monday is Saint Sophia. And her daughters, Vera, Nadezhda, and Lubov, okay, faith, hope, and love. So many years to our Sophia, 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 and Sophia. You know who you are, both in this country and in Europe. And there's probably many more in Africa, but we don't know them all. And Vera, many years to our Vera, many years to our Nadezhda. That's the celebration of Monday. And then <clears throat> Tuesday, it's St. Evmenios. Wednesday, the martyrs Trophimus, Sabatios, and Duramedon of Antioch. Thursday is the great Mara Estatios, Plakitas, his wife Theopisti, and their sons, Agapetus and Theopistos. Uh, we have a beautiful icon of these martyrs, and they have a very moving and touching story, their life in, <clears throat> in the great Synaxaristis. Okay, um, Friday is the Apodesis, which means the leave-taking of the Feast of the Exaltation and the Prophet Jonah. And it looks like we have an icon of the Prophet Jonah here. Yeah. But Father Paul will put up another icon, all right? And Saturday of the Fathers of the Kievan Caves. Wonderful. And what I wonder what they are thinking now, seeing that there's fighting and wars all around them. Okay, <clears throat> so let's go to the epistle and the gospel readings 
I hope our people read the gospel every day and the epistles every day <clears throat> and not just wait for me and for this video sermon to hear them. This should be part of your rule. This is the epistle of St. Paul to the Galatians. <clears throat> for, um, for the feast, for the Sunday after the feast of the exaltation of the cross. Mm -hmm. Brethren, knowing that a man is not being justified by the works of the law except through faith in Jesus Christ. Even we believe in, Jesus, in Christ Jesus in order that we may be justified by faith and not by the works of the law. So he says it twice. Because by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. So, <clears throat> this is why it's so important that the bishops keep the faith. If they don't keep the faith, they lose the blessing of being justified. St. Paul is telling everybody from every generation, a man is not being justified by the works of the law, the Old Testament, except through faith in Jesus Christ. Therefore, we have to keep the faith with very much exactness. And that's why we pray so many times during the services for our bishops for our bishops, that they are not infected by any heresy. Because if, that's, if that happens, they're no longer bishops. And if we follow them, then we are no longer Orthodox Christians, true Orthodox Christians. We're following a man. We're following someone who made up the faith. And that sounds to me like being an idolater. Anybody who makes his own religion is an idolater. The gospel, whosoever is willing to follow after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and keep on following me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and whosoever shall lose his life on account of me and of the gospel, the same shall save it. For what shall a man profit if he should gain the whole world and lose his soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? There's nothing that is equal to the soul which God made in his image and likeness. Then he says this, For whosoever is ashamed of me and of my words in this generation, the adulterous and sinful one, also the Son of Man shall be ashamed of him whenever he should come in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. So that verse describes so much for us, our condition now. We are in the midst of the last times where heresy is encompassing the whole of the church. And this heresy is the greatest of all heresy, it's the heresy of ecumenism. And why do people, why do bishops fall into this trap? This verse explains why. For whosoever is ashamed of me and of my words, this is exactly 
why they have fallen into this horrible and deadly heresy. Because they're ashamed of Christ and of his words. Because he is the one and only God. There's no one other than he. There's no one that came before him. And there's no one that's going to come after him. But how can you say that in this world of the 21st century? They're ashamed to say such a thing. But that's what the gospel says. And of his words, they're ashamed of his words. What words? That Christ only made one church for the salvation of of everybody. All the others, what does he call them? Thieves and robbers. Wolves that enter into the sheepfold. What words? What's the other words he says? <clears throat> There's one faith, one Lord, and one baptism. They're ashamed of that. So they espouse ecumenism, saying, no, everybody, whatever, whatever religion they make or adhere to, whatever it is, it's just as good as orthodoxy. In fact, we said last week, the Pope said it openly again and again and again. He said, all religion, he says, all religions end up with the same God or end up to the same God. Who knows? They're crazy. So this is why we have to be very, very, very careful that we don't stay with men who call themselves bishops and they are ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Don't stay with them. It's to no profit at all. And now, we are going to hear uh, the gospel. The gospel according to St. Matthew. This famous parable that also describes life in the church, life in general of everybody. This is a famous gospel. The Lord said this parable, the kingdom of the heavens. Now Christ came preaching the kingdom of the heavens and whether we know it or not, we all have a law within us that yearns for something else than this life where we die, where we live in sins. So we all yearn for something better. So Christ came teaching the kingdom of the heavens had been like to a man, a king, who made wedding festivities for his son. And he sent forth his slaves to call those who were invited to the wedding festivities. The Old Testament that was instituted to direct everybody to the coming of the Messiah. And he calls it here wedding festivities. And he sent forth his slaves to call those who were invited and they were not willing to come. And again he sent forth other slaves, those are the prophets, Tell those who had been invited, he said, Behold, I prepared the midday meal, 
my ax, my oxen and my fatlings have been slain, and all things are ready. Come to the wedding festivities. And those who are invited, they have no care. So he said, prophets, and having no care for it, it says, they went away, one to his field, another to his commerce. And the rest laid hold of the slaves of the prophets and insulted them and slew them. So ungrateful they were that they slew their own prophets. Now after the king heard it, he was provoked to anger and sent his armies and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. What city? It's Jerusalem. He took away everything. Everything they had. <clears throat> and uh, it was burned and he, just as the prophecy of Christ, there should not be one stone left upon another. It's like a gigantic bulldozer came and it combed the whole earth there. So much so now that the Jews don't even know where their temple was built. <clears throat> but they think now it's in the middle on the top where the Antonian uh, uh, fortress is where the Muslims put their uh, put their mosque then he said to his slaves after he destroyed the wedding indeed is ready but those who have been invited are not worthy go therefore into the thoroughfares and highways and as many as you shall find call them to the wedding festivities. And those slaves went out. Now who are those slaves now? His apostles and his bishops. They went out throughout the, all the world and invited everybody, promising them a wonderful kingdom to be in the presence of God forever and to delight in his countenance. And those slaves went out into the highways and gathered together all, as many as they found, both evil and good. And the wedding was full of those reclining at table. So they, they brought everybody, everybody. It says both evil and good. What does that mean? Those people who are not living a good life, and they're sick of their life. And they hear the gospel, and immediately their heart is kindled with love, and they want to change the way they live. Those are the evil. And the good, those who strive to do what's right. Yeah. And when they hear the gospel, they immediately say, yes, this is what we want. So the wedding, and they're invited into the wedding. And after the king came in to see those reclining at table, he saw there a man who had not clothed himself with a wedding garment. Now, what does that mean? These people are in the wedding. They're in the wedding. They're in the church. They have been baptized. They were given weapons through holy baptism to fight the evil one, the enemy of Christ and all those who believe in him. But these people, they were supposed to fight and not give in to the devil but even though they were baptized, they did not fight. 
and succumbed to the passions. So, they didn't attract the grace of God. They didn't attract the Holy Spirit by living that way. They drove the Holy Spirit away from themselves. That wonderful garment of grace they didn't have. And he said to one, Comrade, how didst thou enter here not having a wedding garment? And he was put to silence, because indeed, what can a person say? Can he, can he make a defense why he listened to the devil and did not listen to Christ? It was his own decision. So he's put to silence. And the king said to the servants, Bind his hands and feet and take him away and cast him out into the darkness, the outer one. Wow. And there shall be there the weeping and the gnashing of the teeth. For many are called and few are chosen. Everybody is called. But they must struggle. And if you end up like a Judas, then you will end up where he is, in the darkness, the outer one. Last Friday, we had the exaltation of the Holy Cross. The exaltation of the cross. And we were, of course, did we wish everybody many years on this the feast day? To all our clergy and parishioners, both in America, Europe, and Africa, many years to you. God bless you. Mm-hmm. Remember, this is, this is a weapon that God has given us to defeat our enemies. Corinthians, St. Paul, on the Feast of the Exaltation, he said, the word of the cross, on the one hand, to those who are perishing is foolishness because they can't understand what God did for those who, who believe in him. But on the other hand, to those beings who are being saved, it is the power of God. He gave the cross to us as a sign of power the power of God. So he says, those who are perishing, they think light of the religion of Christ. And who are those that are perishing? All of those who have no care to please Christ. And they're busy about their their commerce, their land, their bodies, and they're occupied all the time with their games, yes, with their games, their footballs, baseballs, basketballs. You know, people can be so addicted to all of that, to their drinking, to their partying, to their debauchery. Those are the ones who are perishing. But on the other hand, to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Being saved. What's the opposite of Protestantism, where the Protestants say, are you saved? Are you saved? Why? Because you said a certain formula, I believe that Jesus is my personal Savior, and voila, you're saved. Is that how it works? No. Huh. That's laughable. That's laughable. And they're not being saved by thinking that way. For it had been written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and I will set at naught the comprehension of the intelligent. Yeah, they, these people think that they are intelligent. They memorize the scriptures. 
but they then try and figure what they mean. Uh, that's, that's just too much. They make up their own. For after all, they say, we're scholastics, we're, we're intelligent. We've graduated theological schools, colleges, universities. We're intelligent. Well, St. Paul says, where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this age? Did not God make foolish the wisdom of this world and the wisdom of the wise, quote-unquote? For since in the wisdom of God, the world knew not God through its wisdom. Can you imagine? It pleased God through the foolishness of preaching to save those who believe. So St. Paul is saying, if you have the wisdom of the world, most likely you're not going to recognize Christ. Mm -hmm. For since in the wisdom of God, the world knew not God through its wisdom. Through its wisdom, it couldn't, it couldn't find where God is. For indeed, the Jews seek a sign, and it was given them, but they couldn't see it. Christ came and fulfilled every prophecy of the Old Testament. Every prophecy that pointed to the Messiah, Christ fulfilled it. But they couldn't see it. The Greeks seek wisdom, but we proclaim Christ, who had been crucified. To the Jews, on the one hand, a stumbling block. To the Greeks, on the other hand, foolishness. But to those who are called both Jews and Greek, and Greeks, Christ, God's power, and God's wisdom. This is the gospel reading for the exaltation of the cross. We wear the cross all the time, ever since baptism. We wear a cross. We don't take it off, ever. And if you're ordained a priest, you wear the cross outside, not inside uh, on your body, but also outside. So everybody could recognize, hmm, this person is a priest. That's the Orthodox tradition. Because we are not ashamed of the cross. Now, we were having a discussion. Uh, we were asking ourselves, in this sinful and adulterous age of heresy, what bishop, what, what bishop did the most damage to the Orthodox Church in these last times? And the discussion went among the Russians. It has to be Patriarch Sergius Stagorodsky. What did he do? He worked himself up uh, to be Patriarch of Moscow. Patriarch of the whole Russian church. And he did it by collaborating with the atheists who wanted to destroy the church. He collaborated with them in 1927. He said, the joys and victories of the Communist Party is the joy and victory of the church. Now, how can that be? Because the Communist Party, they even said it. <laughs> There's no place for religion in their country. 
and they wanted to destroy the church. It was very difficult, but if they could get a bishop, oh, if they could get a bishop to be a Judas, oh, wow, then we could use that to lawfully, lawfully, according <clears throat> to their laws, to take priests out and kill them. So there were 70 thousand, 70,000 clergy at the time of the Bolshevik Revolution. And this wretched and awful patriarch <clears throat> helped the communists to destroy so many of them and to destroy the church, churches. How many churches were there? 76,000 churches. Does everybody realize what effort and what love it takes to make an Orthodox church? And this patriarch in, in collusion with the atheists, with Lenin, Stalin, Troitsky, all these filthy people, <clears throat> most of them Jews, in collaboration with them, he destroyed so many. The, the biggest church, uh, the biggest Orthodox church in the world, they brought it to its knees. It's a shame. <clears throat> So when one thinks of the damage that Patriarch Sergius did, you think, how, who could surpass such destruction? But then you realize what he destroyed was mostly, mostly the physical part of the church the bodies of the clergy, but their souls, oh my, their souls went to heaven as martyrs. He caused also the starvation. The communists killed uh, millions of people through starvation. And this man had his hand in all of this. But they all became, they all went to the kingdom. Then you look, okay, that's in the Russian church. Then you look at the Greek side. What person did the most damage to the church outside of Russia? to the Greek church, to the churches of the Balkans, to the churches of the Middle East. And without a doubt, it is Petrach Athenagoras. Mm. Last name is Spiro. Why? Well, I think because he, because he was a Mason. And uh, Mason, masonry, and we're going to talk about a, an entry into the Kiss of Judas about these masons. Everybody is welcome into their church. And so Athenagoras ushered in his form of masonry on on the Orthodox Church. It's called ecumenism. We must recognize everybody. And we take the creed and say, we don't believe in the creed anymore. We don't believe in that part where it says, I believe in one, one, holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. 
And he forced everybody to follow him. Of course, not our church, not the Russian church abroad. And sad to say, they did. And look what we have now. Many kisses, many kisses of Judas. So much so that the betrayal is unending. It just doesn't stop. So let's go to the, the Philimita Yuda. And thank you, Father Athanasi, for this, for this translation. It's on page 302. And here's, this is the, this is the page 302. Would they even have pictures of this? Where Patriarch Bartholomew receives honorary distinction from Masonic organizations. The governor of the of Rotary, Mr. Paterakis, presented to Patriarch Bartholomew on behalf of the Rotary Club of Iraklon in Crete, the club's gold medal on November 16, 1992 during the inauguration of the spiritual center of the Archdiocese of Crete. Oh, really? Oh, they're so interwoven with masonry. And it says, his, quote, all holiness, close quote, addressed a highly praised speech the work of the Rotary, which he said he knows well. He emphasized that the actions of the Rotaricians in society fulfill the work of the church. Can you imagine? And he says he wished all Rotaricians progress and success for the benefit of all. This is printed in Rotary Ellis, issue number four, February 1993, page 24. And then Patriarch, another entry on that same page, Patriarch Bartholomew, has also received the highest scout distinction from the scout board in November 1992. Also, Patriarch Bartholomew was proclaimed Honorary President of the Masonic XAN, Christian Youth Association. That was published in a newspaper in October of 1992. And the comment of the publishers of The Kiss of Judas said, quote, if he was not favored by the Masons, he would certainly not have been elected Patriarch of Constantinople. These people are ashamed of the gospel, and look what they have caused. Athenagoras became a heretic, and those who follow him, who commemorate him, who commemorate him, they fall in the same condemnation. So, that's a guarantee that these people are heretics. Same with the Moscow Patriarchate. If nowadays, after communism has fallen, and everybody thinks, oh, we're free now. The church is free. Okay, if the church is free, then it's your duty to renounce and condemn Patriarch Sergius Stagorodsky. And will they do it? Sorry. No, they won't do it. 
Why? Because they're all of the same family. There's no difference. The one ushered in the other, and, and Athenagoras. If, if, they, if they realize that ecumenism is bad, then they should all condemn Athenagoras. And what do they do instead? They make statues of him and put him in front of the theological school in Brookline. Oh, yeah. They don't condemn him. They give awards in his name. So these people are very sick, and it's a shame. So to all those who are in the Greek archdiocese, it's been long ago since you should have left. And look what you have now. Look at the archbishop that you have now. Uh, his name is Elpidophorus, the first, who many believe is a homosexual because he indulges in gratifying the desires of so many homosexuals. So that's where Athenagoras has led the Greek archdiocese to someone like that. Okay, so that were the readings on September 14th, the Exaltation of the Cross. Remember, that feast day we have it's a fast day. It's a feast day, but it's a fast day because it's the exaltation. Memory is brought by the Holy Church of the crucifixion. So there is no meat, no fish, no dairy, no oil, no alcohol on that day. But... If that feast day falls on a weekend, Saturday or Sunday, where according to the canons you're not allowed to fast, the church says you are allowed to have wine and oil. And that means olive oil. <clears throat> okay. Also, on the exaltation of the cross, it happens that we celebrate the memory of St. Macarius of Thessalonica, the new martyr. So it's always nice to read uh, one of the new martyrs or one of the martyr, or one of the saints in this past week. So I thought we would talk about this. St. Macarius, a disciple of Patriarch Nephon, who was at that time, um, at that time, the uh, was laboring in asceticism in the monastery of Mount Athos called Vatopedi. And Macarius longed for martyrdom for the sake of Christ. And he was a disciple of St. Nephon. And he begged his elder, Nephon, for a blessing to seek martyrdom. Now, I said, it's it's... You're so fortunate to have a clairvoyant person uh, as an elder because then you know f for, sh for certain if something is pleasing to God. <clears throat> so he asked him, and the patriarch prayed, and it was revealed to the patriarch that this was God's will. And he blessed him for the way of martyrdom. And St. Macarius went to Thessalonica in the midst of a crowd of Turks and began to speak of Christ as the one true God. Yeah, he was an ecumenist for sure. <clears throat> the Turks seized him and threw him into prison. See what happens when you see in the, if Muslims have power? When he was brought to trial, Macarius cried out to the Turks, Oh, that you would come to know the truth and be baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. They couldn't, they couldn't stand that. 
So the Turks took him out in th right then and there in 1527 and beheaded him. At the very moment when St. Macarius was beheaded, it was revealed to St. Nephon, he saw in the spirit when he was at Vatopedi <clears throat> that Macarius had attained martyrdom and he told the monks of the death by martyrdom saying, know my children that your brother Macarius has today died a martyr and is born triumphing and rejoicing in the Lord. May we be worthy of blessings by his prayers. It's from the Marathos Patrologi. The Tuesday before that was the memory of Saint Afrosinus the cook. He was a simple man, a man of God. He served as cook at a certain monastery in the ninth century. So I don't think he went to seminaries because originally seminaries where nowadays students, they get their heads polluted. If your teacher is an ecumenist, you're going you're gonna to wind up an ecumenist. And that's what probably happened to all the clergy nowadays. But he was a simple person. He did his prayers. He read his gospel, read the epistles, studied them. The spiritual father of the monastery dreamed one night that he saw in paradise. He was taken to paradise and saw a frosiness, one of his disciples, there in paradise. Said so Afrosinus turned to him and gave him, he must have smiled at him, and he gave him three apples on a branch. Three apples from paradise. And the abbot woke up, and of course, when you wake up, the first thing you do is you make your cross. <clears throat> And lo and behold, he saw these three apples, lovely and fragrant, on his pillow. And so he immediately ran and found Ephrosinus. And he said, tell me, where were you last night, brother? And Ephrosinus said, Father, forgive me, I'm a sinner. He tried to, because he knew what was revealed to the abbot. I was doing my prayers. Tell me where you were, Ephrosinus. And then he said, <clears throat> I was where you were, Father. And the abbot then revealed the whole incident to all the monks in the monastery. And all came to know the holiness and godliness of St. Ephrosinus, because he never complained. He did his work. He had the hardest job in the, con in the monastery. To be a cook is the hardest job. Mm -hmm. But he, fearing the, the praise of men, immediately fled, fled from the monastery and hid himself in the desert where he spent the rest of his life. St. Ephrosinus the cook. Everybody should have an icon of St. Ephrosinus the cook. Where would you put that? You'd put that in your kitchen. Right? Okay. Let's go now to the Fulokalia and read some fathers from the Fulokalia. <clears throat> and this is Saint uh, Saint Gregory of Sinai. In the case of a beginner in the art of spiritual warfare, God alone can expel thoughts, for it is only those strong in such warfare who are in a position to wrestle with them and banish them. 
Yet even they do not achieve this by themselves, but they fight against them with God's assistance, clothed in the armor of his grace. So, when thoughts invade you, in place of weapons, call on the Lord Jesus frequently and persistently, and then they will retreat, for they cannot bear the warmth produced in the heart by prayer, and they flee as if scorched by fire. See, everybody has to fight, because we're going to be fought against, so you have to fight back. St. Philotius of Sinai, we have in us a mental warfare more arduous than physical warfare. The aim of the doer of righteousness, which he should pursue with his mind and towards which he should strive, is to have the memory of God treasured in his heart like pres- like priceless pearl, like a priceless pearl or some other precious stone. He should abandon everything, even the body, and disregard his present life itself in order to have only God in his heart. For St. John Chrysostom says that mental contemplation of God is by itself sufficient to destroy the evil spirits. How nice. Always have the remembrance of God. And of course we do that through the Jesus prayer. St. John of Constant now as we approach the end, he says, when holy peace reigns in my soul, then surely the King of Peace dwells within me, the Lord Jesus Christ, with the Father and the Holy Spirit. And then especially I ought to be full of feelings of gratitude to the Lord of Peace and endeavor with all my strength to persevere, to preserve this peace within me by means of fervent prayer and by abstaining from every sin, both inward and outward. Nice. Okay. Glory be to God. Thank you all for listening. And we wish you uh, a very spiritually profitable uh, week. And we want to make a note that uh, we will be um, going on a job uh, this coming week. And so, but we will have a video to substitute for our departure. Okay, thank you. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Amen.